first speaker in uh, the use of AI in verification is Kevin Suez from Advanced.ai. He's a CEO. CEO. Uh, it's a remote presentation. Um, he's the CEO and CTO of Advance and has been awarded 84 patents worldwide. He led pioneering work on the first cellular data smartphone um, air communicator, the first plastic multi-chip semiconductor packages, the first human-like AI virtual assistant called Portico, soundproof drywall, high R-value windows, AI-driven building management technology, AI-driven QA automation, and the window so energy retrofits of the Empire State Building and New York Stock Exchange. Um, I did notice in there there was a AI driven QA automation, which I think is a topic today. So over to you, thank you, Kevin. Great, great thank you. I talk about today is 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 uh, our last two years of experience of AI and software testing. This isn't specifically about uh, CAD, specifically about uh, validation of hardware. It's a specific type of types of software, specifically HTML5 software, which is applicable in some cases and not applicable in others. But we've learned a lot over the last two years. So I thought that that would be interesting. Let's go to the next slide that says topics. <clears throat> and these are our topics today. We've only got about uh, 15 minutes, so um, we're just going to dive right in. But but did want to talk about how we use AI, how AI could be applied to overall QA and what we've kind of seen, right? Let's go to the next slide. It has a sort of an AI up in the left-hand corner and, a, and it starts with banking on the right side. And so these are areas that we are seeing artificial intelligence uh, generally have success in, right? Across the, uh, across the globe. Uh, certainly banking and financial trading, we all know about speech recognition and image recognition. So we all know about these. Obviously, facial recognition on, on, on Facebook was one of the uh, uh, sort of earlier applications of a certain kind of uh, type of AI. Okay, marketing search, natural language processing, um, et cetera. Uh, so in healthcare, we're seeing some, some great advances. For example, looking at EKGs and looking at uh, the output of, um, of X-ray images and CT scans, where in fact the AI, which is not a surprise, is better than the doctor. So we know that in theory, this technology can work, but it doesn't always work in every field. And so let's go to the next uh, slide that says AI general versus narrow. And I think this is an important thing for everybody to take away from a conference like this that's looking at futures. How do we apply f technologies to what we're doing and how's that going to be applied to the future? So on the left-hand side is kind of what the general public thinks of AI. And, and, and what that is, is it's driven by scientists in Hollywood. It's like the movie Her and, and like the movie Ex Machina. These are very cool things. That's AI doing multiple tasks and understanding things. That's the general public's idea of AI, but that's not what we work on. What we work on uh, it, truly in industry is driven by one task, it's practical, and what we're trying to do is mimic what humans are doing in that task and do it at least as good as humans would do. So humans do facial recognition very well. Humans can understand speech very well, right? So we pick one task, very practical, and it's what professionals focus on, and it turns out quality assurance testing of all kinds is something that today is done broadly speaking 70 to 80 percent in many industries by humans with limited automation and so you go okay well this is clearly a task that we might be able to apply quote unquote ai or machine learning to so let's go to the next slide <clears throat> and it just has some boxes there that says machine learning towards the top and um, these are the different areas of machine learning. And, and I, I'm going to point this out. I'm going to point the next slide out, too, because uh, over the last few years, all we hear about is neural nets. It's a lot of what the talk is. And that's because we've gotten very, very good at deep neural nets. And deep neural nets is kind of a, a type of math that is exceptionally good at certain things like image recognition and speech recognition, where you have very, very large databases to learn from but it is not always applicable to everything we're doing. Now let's go to the next slide and you'll see this kind of tree structure that has machine learning algorithms is sort of in the middle. These are all the popular areas of machine learning algorithms. And so what I want you to take away from this is when we're in this field deciding when a vendor like us, a technologist, 
technology company, is deciding how to solve a problem with machine learning, we have hundreds of algorithms to choose from not just the popular ones, which is deep learning over the last few years, but many, many others that are in fact actually more valuable to solve certain conditions in certain situations than a deep neural net where uh, with deep learning, uh, the problem is again, I've gotta have a very large clean database like facial recognition or speech recognition, but other areas don't have that. So if you have an application, it turns out an application, whatever it does, a piece of software, is probably unique in what it does. It was written by a unique a team for a unique purpose, probably using a, a different library than others may have used. And so there isn't the kind of deep learning opportunity there that you might think of. So we use a trick that, uh, that many people are finding in AI you have to use. It's called AI hinting. Now, AI hinting is very important. What it means is that humans know a lot. Let's not throw out what the humans know and completely do it with AI, let's mix the two. Let's let humans hint to the AI what's important and what isn't important. So I'll give you a simple idea. We all log into applications every day that we use or build or work on, whatever, we log in. Well, if AI were to log in and try to learn the application, it might find right after logging in one very important button on the, law, on, on, the, on the page after login called log out. It would click that and it would log out and it would say, I've learned the application. I logged in, I found a page, I logged out. So of course in AI hinting, we immediately say, don't click log out right away. That would be a dumb thing to do because humans already know this. It, it doesn't have to learn that and spend time learning that that's a bad idea. Let's just tell it it's a bad idea. So we use that in conjunction with sort of a variety of of math algorithm. Next slide that says one could use AI. Scripts or automatically generate tests and find bugs. But in the end, what we wanna do is reduce the time that it takes to do this work. It's not as much about cost, it's about time. Can we? cut the time and improve the outcomes, or at least be at the same level? And, and, and we have found the answer is yes. So let's go to the next slide. And again, we're, you know, we're talking specifically about software QA here. And this says where QA people spend their time. And in fact, where QA people spend their time today around the industry is manual testing, followed by writing scripts, which are automation scripts to automate their testing, followed by fixing scripts, and then there's those other little areas. So, so for us, you know, my view is always, if you wanna reduce time, uh, apply technology to that where people spend their time. And that's exactly what we chose to do with, with our time. So the next slide says our goals of AI and QA. And our goals were to basically eliminate test maintenance, generate thousands of valid scripts by itself in minutes, validate virtually anything, find more important bugs, and make this the centerpiece of kind of a continuous testing process. Now on the next slide, it says five levels of test automation. Of course, the levels of test autonomy can be applied to many industries, and this in fact was lifted from the SAE that applies this to driverless vehicles. And this is just a way to apply it to software QA. You could apply this to hardware validation and verification. You could apply it to anything. Of course, the words would change a bit. But you'll find that most people in the world, in almost any field today, are at level zero or maybe level one. And, and you get to level two and people get more uh, uh, um, capable and, and, and faster. Teams get faster. And finally, you go all the way up to level five, which is basically hands off, minds off. It doesn't say that you're not going to hint it. It doesn't say that you don't have a lot of setup. But basically, it's going to run itself. Let's go to the next one. Models, human tester behaviors. These are some of the behaviors that one sees in, in, in people doing their work, and that's the best model that you can build for AI. You don't try to go out and build something from scratch or from new. You say, what do people do, and how can we um, uh, leverage that? And on the next one, next slide, how we use machine learning, you don't have to memorize all this, but what's important here is that in, in, in what we did, in the work we did so far, there are 19 areas of machine learning, not one. And so people think of AI or machine learning as there's one big algorithm and it will do X. 
And that's certainly true in facial recognition. But when you get into applications or hardware and software and HTML5 and uh, other applications, mobile applications, et cetera, it turns out there are lots of decisions to make that are maybe unrelated to other decisions. And so you've got to do a, a, a lot of different areas of machine learning that pass off what it learns to the next stage and it learns something and it passes that off, right? So that's, that's the important lesson there. So the next slide says AI-driven testing. I won't get into this too deeply, but the, the way we decided uh, to go after, after, frankly, lots of trial and error was there would be two uh, areas. One, we'd learn uh, the application called an AI blueprint, and two, which would be optional, uh, the system would generate specifically re regression scripts based on what it learned, the application usages from production, which is really a fascinating way to do it. So most applications are upgrades of applications. They're not new. And because of that, there's something you can learn from the way they're being used today. And then the next slide says data-driven validation. There are a number of validation uh, things that we added because humans validate with their eyes. And they can put in input fields like you see here and then validate that the number is the correct number, for example. On the next slide, you'll see uh, 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 this is a web page, a, a company called Copart. Um, and they have 4.4 million pages in this application. And you'll see non-repairable is circled in yellow. And when you go then to the next slide after that, you might see non-repairable says search results for non-repairable. And the point here is, wouldn't you want to check to make sure that every single link takes you to the exact right page? That's the most important thing. And so, of course, AI can do that. It can say, do these fields match and do they always match? And it can learn what the application does and what it doesn't do. And then we go to the next one. This is something that says dynamic elements in the upper left. And dynamic elements is a real problem to, uh, uh, to test in any kind of application. Anything that's dynamic is difficult for humans to test because it's changing potentially second by second. How do you test something that changes second by second? Well, it turns out AI is pretty good at that uh, because it can look at, for instance, the API or the information coming in to the front end and say, uh, in this case, how many boxes are there? How many did the server request to be displayed and are they the right ones? In this particular application, there can be from one to eight uh, boxes. And so very hard for humans to test. Um, much, much, much easier for a machine to test. So. Um, sort of the sort of the outcome of that on the next slide, you'll see these hundred percent numbers and zero percent is because the system can blueprint the application at every single build. Now this is important. Every change gets reblueprinted all over again. Uh, that means you get a hundred percent blueprint coverage of all the actions in unique pages in this particular case for these kinds of applications. One hundred percent production user flow coverage and no maintenance. And there's no maintenance because all the tests are thrown away and rebuilt at the next build. That's what's really, really fascinating about doing it this way. So let's go on to challenges in our last couple of minutes here. Um, what are the challenges? Well, uniquely data-driven workflows are not necessarily the best target. If there's only two pages and everything else is data, well, it'll run it, but, but you're really testing for the data logic. Is the data logic working? And so AI, is good, but it may not be the fastest way or only way to do that. Um, the setup and AI hinting today is generally done by the, the, the people who wrote this technology, not the client. And the reason is, is that when um, a client uses this, they are QA people. They know their application, but they actually don't know anything about AI hinting uh, or smart tagging or validations. So they really don't know what to do with it. They weren't trained in that field. So often we see across all fields that vendors set up AI, that is the people who wrote the AI system set it up. Uh, it, and that doesn't matter if it's for banking or if it's for customer support or it's for sales or whatever. Um, generally, they know how the AI works the best. And so you kind of have to step back a little bit and help them learn what your goals are and allow the vendor to set that up. And patience is a virtue. This is not a field where you see uh, a win in a day. It's a field where you see a great win over the course of a year and maybe pretty good win over the course of a few months. That's what you see. And so you've got to have that kind of patience to leverage this. Um, uh, final couple slides here. Outcomes, uh, QA runs that, that 
that validate more than before in about a tenth of the time, maybe faster. You find a lot more bugs, actually. This is the surprise. Um, it's a lot more bugs than human testers will find. That may be uh, applicable to all of these different fields. We're just finding more. It happens to be applicable in these kinds of applications. Firms do rethink what their QA people do, and more test data, better analysis, more tests, more validations. But the key motivator is time and coverage. You know, can we find more bugs in less time? Can we find more issues in less time and not pass them off to our clients? Uh, it does become the cornerstone and decider of a sort of a DevOps pipeline, which is a continuous test and deployment pipeline. Uh, and it does uh, drive a continuous testing culture. And just about the last slide here, I, I always end, end with this, uh, or almost end with this. Um, as a professional, your job will not be replaced by artificial intelligence. Instead, you could be replaced by others who leverage AI to do your job. So um, uh, I encourage you in your own fields to reach out and look and see what our company's doing. We can go to the last slide. That's my contact information if you need it. Um, uh, reach out and see what's available for what you're working on and can you try it. it you're not going to be able to try it for free because there's usually a lot of setup involved in these POCs, but, um, but you do want to get into the game and, um, and not ignore it because this technology is already here. It may be bleeding edge, but you want to be on the bleeding edge with it. Okay, um, I think we have one minute left for questions if there are any. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for uh, no, it's difficult circumstances. We do have a, a question. Yes. Hi, Kevin. Um, I work in um, um, safety approval for um, domestic appliances. Yes. Um, and we do a lot of, it's got a lot of software in. Um, how would you see this being adapted to uh, help us to gain safety compliance? Yes. It's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a great question. So. Um, you know, it depends on the software, depends on how it's being used. So, for instance, people are using it now in the in the U.S. for FDA compliance. Um, and uh, for FDA, you've got a bunch of rules uh, about medical devices that you have to essentially recertify it, basically, if you change the software. And people don't want to recertify the entire thing if you change the software. So they're using this to, to prove out that in the way people use it, the outcomes will be the same. Does that make sense? So you can set up database validations and say, as long as it revalidates across whatever, it could be hundreds of thousands of points of data, then indeed the software is working within its, its uh, spec or tolerations, right? And um, I think that's what we're seeing. So I think that's probably applicable to your field as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you.